thought horses were domesticated animals. This is a remnant bunch. This is what the millions looked like that roamed the West. These are incredible creatures, and I find that they fit where we, where we see them out there. I'm not gonna live long enough to learn half the things that I would like to know about wild horses. We have a few wild horse herds around the United States. The prior mountain horses have genetic markers in them that are unique to those particular horses, clearly linking them to the old Spanish uh, horse. Then you have other wild horse herds where the link is much, much closer to the Morgan horse or draft horse in them. If you took, let's say, 30 or 40 domestic horses of a variety of breeds and turn them loose and come back in 300 years and see what you have, they all pretty much look the same. Natural selection in a harsh environment really slashes hard and leaves you with what we call a primitive horse that shouldn't be meant in a deleterious way biologically. They're fit. They're much more fit for their environment than the horse that they evolved from over those 300 years. And we seem to always get to the same place. A small, tough horse that has some unique characteristics, immunologically, nutritionally. When you spend some time with these horses, they're so different, they're so unique from domesticated animals. I can go out there and, and watch an old stallion, you know, herding a bunch of mares and things like that, or seeing two stallions fight. It's very, very unique. Not too many people have ever seen that in our country. Uh, I find going out and watching these wild horses to be every bit as interesting, more interesting. Uh, from a behavioral standpoint, you start to name them. Bison, elk, deer, antelope, go ahead, name it. You can't find anything out there with as complex a social organization and social structure as the wild horse. We have the harem band a sexually mature stallion in charge of a group of mares that could be anywhere from one mare to 20-some mares. Within the harem band, you have social hierarchies. There's a stallion, but that stallion has only two purposes, to keep other stallions away during the breeding season and to breed those mares. He makes no decision about when to feed, where to feed. Uh, there's a lead mare, and she makes those decisions. And then you have at age three, young stallions are drummed out of the band. They're not allowed to stay there anymore. And horses are very gregarious. One of the cruelest things you can do to a horse is keep one alone. They must have other horses with them. And in no time at all, they seek one another out and you have bachelor bands. And the bachelor bands are great. They're just like a bunch of teenagers. And they're essentially checking out the action. Where are the mares? What's happening? What's going on? And then you have the old lone stallions, which are drummed out. If they lose, they're finally too old and a younger stallion. And they go off pretty much by themselves. And they don't generally live very long after that happens. And I've always attributed it to the stress of being alone for the first time in their, in their lives. So you have both a social, behavioral, and even physiological change as we domesticate these, these animals. And that may be part of the reason some people don't like to look at the wild horse as a wildlife species, because they keep seeing a domestic horse. What have we bred domestic horses for? We bred them for their size and their conformation and their color, virtually everything that's useless to a horse. What we have done is to take a wild animal and we have bred it in the image that we've created in our own mind for a whole bunch of different reasons. To run fast around an oval track, or to jump over a bunch of sticks, or to whatever. Whatever we breed horses for. Wild horses are out there trying to survive. And reproduction, being able to get by sickness on their own. Uh, nutrition, being able to live on substandard nutrition. Those are the important things to them. And once you see what they're all about, you'll never be the same when it comes to 
when it comes to wild horses. To a lot of people, they would say, no, a horse is a horse. But you have to have a sense of history to appreciate something like that. I like to take sort of the long view of history, that long durée view, and to me, horses are actually native species to North America. That's an unpopular view in a lot of circles. I've had people tell me that, you know, horses are nothing more than uh, just like uh, turning cows loose in a pasture. That's all they are, they're just another exotic. It is very clear that the origin of, of the equids was right here in North America. Colorado, Kansas, Wyoming, um, western Nebraska, that particular region. And of course we go through 60 million years of evolution with the equids. Horses originated here in North America and then later went to other continents. And that starts about 55 million years ago. So we have a long history of horse evolution here in North America. And then about 3.7 million years ago, the great diversity of horses that we had here in North America declined down to three, but one of the three horses included this skeleton right here, which is the earliest representative of Equus, which is the group that all modern horses belong to. What we have here in Hagerman is the earliest known representative of our modern horse. The horse family is a, is a really a great example of long-term evolution. The small horse, Eohippus, or Hyracotherium, which was the first horse the size of a small dog. It had four toes on the front, three toes on the back legs. As environmental changes came about, its legs got longer, it drops the side toes, becomes a one-toed horse, or hoof. And this is a modern horse hoof. The modern horse hoof has a much larger hoof than our Hagerman horse does. The Hagerman horse uh, is so closely related to today's horse and also they believe to the modern Grievy's zebra that lives in Africa. As it continues to evolve, this animal gets much bigger in size. It also changed its eating habits from being a browser to being a grazer. At some point in their evolution, they um they appear to have disappeared from North America. And prior to that, some of them migrated to Eurasia, um, presumably over the Bering Land Bridge. Um, meanwhile, what happened to the American stock, or the North American stock, um, is pretty much a mystery. The, the big question is this business of what happened to the horses. The fossil record tells us uh, that around uh, 11,000 years ago, they disappeared. Along with them disappear our native camels, mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, saber cats, dire wolves, and another 20 uh, kinds of large animals that I won't have time to mention. What happens around 11,000 years ago? The climate is changing. And for the first time, people are coming into the new world in large numbers. Now, those two possibilities are the basis of a really interesting debate I mean, horses constituted in some areas as much as a third of the biomass of the Pleistocene fauna. And so it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the idea of that many animals um, going belly up so fast. Of course, the bottom line is no one knows for sure. The most widely accepted theory um, is that the only apocal event that uh, coincided with the disappearance of the horse was the arrival of man on the continent. And just as with the mammoth, the theory is that they were simply hunted to extinction in a relatively short period of time. I think it's a remote one, but there's certainly a possibility that uh, something people were accompanied by, perhaps diseases, is involved in the disappearance of the horses. The reason I have to say that is because there are no kill sites. There are no archaeological associations of uh, Clovis points or other artifacts with uh, horses. 
They disappear around the same time that we first see the fluted points of the Clovis hunters. And uh, that's all we can say. It's hard to imagine if you just consider a human overkill hypothesis that people might have extinguished these large herds of horses that were quite widely dispersed. It's, it's hard to imagine this, at least it is for me. The surroundings, the grasslands, were still a great environment for horse survival. This is one reason I find it difficult to believe that all the horses of this vintage died out around 10,000 years ago, as the received knowledge says. I sometimes think that we have one or two ways of solving a problem. Nature has umpteen ways of solving that problem, so we've got to be a bit humble when we're stating these hypotheses. We know that there was a glacial, glacial refuge in Alaska um, in which moose survived the Wisconsin glacial period. So it's possible that horses survived up there. It's possible that some survived somewhere else. I've been told there's fragmentary evidence that maybe they did make it, but I think that in general you can't prove it one way or another. Yes, it is possible that uh, some horses, I suppose, survived the so-called extinction. They would have probably survived in little pockets, and then with the arrival of the reintroduced horse, in very short order, been diluted genetically, very possible with horses. But I don't make that argument simply because you shouldn't go around and make arguments like that unless you have something to back them up with. Um, I have something to back me up with when I say Equus caballus was here 1.7 million years ago. It originated in North America and it co-evolved with its habitat here. And it was the same species that was brought back by man a reintroduced wildlife species. And uh, I've always thought that when they returned, they really had come home. With the reintroduction of wild horses, do we treat them as an exotic species? or have we merely returned a, a native to it, its homeland? The wild horses come from the cabalines. They represent a distinct group within modern horses. We're not sure if there were true cabaline horses here in North America. Some people who work on fossil horses think, yeah, they were here. Other uh, people say, no, they weren't. The cabaline horse is an old world form. Certainly, if we say cabaline horses were here and then became extinct, then a reintroduction of a cabaline horse makes a little bit more sense ecologically that probably they're close enough. If we don't have any strong evidence that the cabaline horses, the domestic horse lineage group, was here, then you're a step closer to saying it's probably more of an exotic species and not exactly an ecological equivalent of something that disappeared 10,000 years ago. Certainly when you get up into the Yukon where we've gotten frozen specimens, you actually have something that you can extract DNA from and, and do a matchup. This is one of the best uh, complete skulls we have of Equus lami. This is the uh, Pleistocene or Ice Age Yukon horse. The radiocarbon dates on these average around 25 or 26,000 years ago. So it's almost exactly the same age as this carcass and they both are of the same species. It's a cabaloid horse. In other words, it's very close to the modern horse. There are um, specimens of this uh, kind of horse throughout Alaska into the Yukon and right along the adjacent Northwest Territories coasts. So it's all over uh, Northwestern North America. And there were quite a number of herds and they're probably fairly large herds according to the number of uh, bones we find. In the Yukon and Alaska, uh, the most common remains of Ice Age vertebrates are bison and horses. 
these specimens here. These are uh, some of the bits of horse here that were found with this pelt. And um, there were a few remains of skin also. These are remains of the uh, skin that were found with this animal. And uh, perhaps most interesting to a lot of people would be this, which is just a, a horse turd or dropping. And that gives us a lot of information on what they were actually feeding on. And this consists almost entirely of grass remains. So it suggests that the ancient environment in this region was uh, a grassland. You know, at least there were large tracts of grassland. Horses basically evolved with the stipe of grasses, the cool season needle and thread type grasses, needle grasses, spread across the West. Horses basically co-evolved with those grasses. Wildlife doesn't evolve independent of its habitat. It evolves to what it is because of that habitat. Wildlife shapes the land and the land shapes the wildlife. And, and that is coevolution. A good definition of, of a native species is one that has co-evolved with its habitat. And you wouldn't have to go any further with the horse. It co-evolved with its habitat. Yes, there was a 10,000 year gap, but from the standpoint of evolution of habitat, that didn't make a difference at all. The major argument that's, that's used that the horse is not a native species is that the species that went extinct 10,000 years ago was not the same species that Cortez uh, brought back in 1519. Uh, one could argue breeds, but one can't argue species. The molecular biology evidence shows that the Cabaloid horse was here in North America 1.7 million years ago. This is uh, a species called Equus scotti. This specimen from Rock Creek in Texas is about a million years old. This basic kind of horse is a cabaloid type. It's not far away from the modern domestic horse. The horse originated in North America. It evolved to the cabaloid horse 1.7 million years ago which means the horse that left us 10,000 years ago was the Cabaloid horse, and it was simply returned by the hand of man to its native habitat. So what you have is a bunch of arguments over, over breeds rather than species. But that's convenient for those who would like to keep the exotic label on it. And out of that sort of thing comes policy. Whether or not the policy has any scientific veracity behind it isn't important to a state agency or a government agency. Uh, if they can put the label exotic on it, that means they can manage it in ways that uh, they couldn't manage it if it was a native species. Yeah, there's three up there. You know, the idea that horses are a native uh, species to North America is unpopular with a lot of people because of our, our assumptions that what we, we want the wilderness of North America to be is this landscape as it was seen at the moment of first European contact. And that was a landscape without horses in it. We've for a very long time had this notion that if animals weren't on the scene at the time when Europeans saw the place, they don't deserve uh, a place in the, the native taxon. But that's no that's no magical time, you know. That's just one of the snapshots in a very long continuum. Whether the Spaniards brought them back or whether they came across on an ice floe doesn't really matter to me all that much. The fact is they did get back here the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 was the event that spread horses across the West. Uh, the Spaniards had founded New Mexico, uh, the colonies in northern New Mexico, uh, in the first decade of the 1600s. 
And by 1680 or so, the Pueblo Indians had gotten sick of Spanish domination, especially religious domination, and so they uh, they rose up and chased them out of uh, New Mexico for 12 years. In the process of doing that, they basically managed to capture, liberate all the stock animals that were found in northern New Mexico. All that had to happen was for a few horses to get loose, and in uh, overnight terms, they multiplied into the millions. They reoccupied the niche that had been sitting there waiting for them for 10,000 years. And almost by five-year increments after 1680, you can chart the acquisition of horses northward up the Rocky Mountains. The Navajos get horses. The Utes get horses. The Shoshones get horses. The Bannocks get horses. The Salish get horses. And this is by about 1710 or so. From that avenue of diffusion, uh, horses are uh, funneled from New Mexico all the way into uh, what is now Saskatchewan and Alberta. And they spread eastward across the plains too, probably within about a decade. I mean, there are, there are European accounts that indicate that within a decade after 1680, uh, the tribes of what's now Oklahoma and Texas all have horses and all know how to ride horses. Some of the uh historical accounts in the 1800s of um, what travelers saw as they went west were that the most uh, common and wildest of the native animals were the horses. Think of the horse historically in North America. It gave rise to a whole new culture, the, the Northern Plains horse culture. You know, it only survived for 200 years, but, but it, it, it caused a whole new culture to erupt and flourish. And then, of course, it disappeared. We took care of that. The first attack on wild horses was to dismount Native Americans so that they'd be easier to conquer. And um, there was a huge program of shooting wild horses in the thousands in the United States, and it's been well documented. So then we go from that, which was a utilitarian means for attacking horses, to another, an economic means. Um, horses were shot by the hundreds of thousands for dog meat. Um, you'd get several hundred dollars for a horse up until fairly recently. And so then we have this economic incentive to get rid of them. They were basically vermin. We uh, de-buffaloed the plains, everybody knows that, but we de-wolfed the plains. Uh, we wiped out the prairie dogs. Um, we made war on magpies, even. Uh, and one of the animals that ended up being decimated in the 19th century was the, the horse. One estimate is that there were probably two million of them south of the Arkansas River on the Great Plains by 1800. Nobody's really made an effort to try to estimate how many were in the West by 1850, but however many there were, basically were wiped out by the process of a commercial trade that essentially targeted the wild horses of the West as stock and domestic animals for the advancing American frontier. So there was a, a horse trade economy. In parts of the West, it was the major economy for as long as a couple of decades. It went on through the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century. In fact, something like 300,000 horses were rounded up in the West uh, between the Boer War in 1898 and the end of World War I. Uh, there was also uh, by the end of the 19th century, and especially in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a market for horse meat in the United States, and slaughterhouses were set up down on the Texas Gulf Coast. So that what you get is, is really kind of a remarkable thing, and it's analogous to the buffalo story. An uh, image of the plains that in the 1850s were swarming with horses and buffalo, and by 1915, 1920, had neither animal, uh, an absolutely empty landscape except for at that time a few prairie dogs. From a historical point of view, the, the U.S. Grazing Service was merged with the General Land Office in 1946 to form the Bureau of Land Management. Previous to that merger, the uh, U.S. Grazing Service had a 
unspoken policy to actually uh, shoot wild horses on sight, and they were considered vermin pests um, to be eliminated. Competition with cattle and sheep, basically. Wild horses on the public lands are driven down to anywhere from 10 to 17,000 by the uh, early 1970s. Velma B. Johnson, who was dubbed Wild Horse Annie, when she saw some uh, very uh, cruelly treated wild horses in a, in a truck, Mustangers were uh, driving the truck to apparently uh, slaughter, and uh, horses had been very severely injured and were bleeding, and she was following this truck that had blood dripping from it, and that was part of the, the beginnings of her movement to save wild horses from being so cruelly treated. The Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act has been amended several times, but the basic premise of it has never uh, been altered, and that is to protect wild horses on lands uh, that are managed by the U.S. Forest Service and by the Bureau of Land Management. Congress in 1971 passed the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act, which basically said horses are to be managed as an integral part of the ecosystem on the lands that they are currently found. I think the Bureau of Land Management, before the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act was passed, had pretty free reign on how they managed wild horses. And it was an intrusion on their their ability to manage as they so pleased and if there were horses that were, they felt were competing with a rancher's livestock or a rancher felt that horses were competing with their sheep, then they could be removed. So strangely enough, the agency that has been mandated to protect them has historically not protected them, in fact had the view that they should be eliminated. And uh, I think unfortunately that historical view has carried through. I've read a lot of accounts of the capture of wild horses in the, the 1700s and 1800s. And uh, those accounts are, are pretty evocative. The Spaniards, for example, had a whole vocabulary to describe why so many horses died after being herded into pens and, and uh, being captured. They had a term uh, uh, called despacio, which referred to the death of horses from nervous rage over capture. The Mustangers in uh, Texas and New Mexico in the 18th century had a term sentimiento, which referred to horses that died from heartbreak at capture. Those kinds of, of uh, historical accounts make me think of horses as 
you know, truly wild animals. I think they probably re reacted the way elk uh, or, or bison or most, uh, most wild animals would have reacted. It maybe sounds silly to some people because they don't think of wild horses as, as a natural species. But uh, when you break up a family, they're undergoing a tremendous amount of stress and sometimes injury and sometimes death even. Over the uh, last 30 years, the BLM has determined where the animals should be managed, and that's what we do today. We manage wild horses and burros in herd management areas. To be a wild free roaming horse and burro, the animal needs to live on or come from one of those herd management areas. The um, desire is that the BLM would manage these horses so that they are living on healthy rangelands. It's very important that the range be healthy because there are not only wild horses, but there are cattle, livestock, uh, such as sheep, uh, other animals out there, wildlife. So to have healthy horses, you really need a healthy rangeland. Nevada has about 24 to 25,000 wild horses right now. Uh, this next year they're trying to increase the numbers that they want to remove and I believe it's up to over 6,000. Uh, it's an attempt to remove a larger number of animals to make a difference. We manage um, cattle on BLM land by when they go on and off the land. They go on at certain times of the year and they come off at certain times of the year. Wild horses and burros are on all year long and um, they're managed mostly by removing the excess and leaving a population on the land that is sufficient to uh, take care of the, uh, you know, where there's enough water and, and vegetation to take care of that uh, population you leave behind. The BLM has repeatedly sacrificed the interests of wild horses for livestock interests. In fact, they have bent over backwards to accommodate livestock. And while they are supposed to manage these ranges primarily for horses, as the 1971 Wild Horse and Burrow Act says they are, they still very much manage these areas for cattle. We have a few thousand wild horses on literally millions of acres of public land and on those same lands we have millions of cows and sheep. And the BLM will say we're having some damage, it's from horses, we need to get the horses off. And they will keep the cattle on that range while lowering the number of horses. People tend to think of this as a single issue, and it's not. It's really a multiple use issue. Congress says we're going to have wild horses and burros out there, that they're part of the legacy of our, our Western heritage. But it's not exclusively managed for wild horses and burros. With rare exception, it's managed for all of these different uses. We consider personally that we are in a partnership with the federal agencies where we lease land from the federal government, either the Forest Service or the BLM. And we try to work closely with them in a partnership capacity to protect the resource and to enhance the resource and not to degrade it. There is a tremendous amount of subsidy going on right now to encourage livestock grazing on public lands. It probably cost a child more to feed a hamster on a monthly basis than it does to sustain a cow and a calf on public lands. There is a lot of deference, I believe, from authority agencies to livestock permittees who have more influence. A lot less livestock permittees are 
the smaller ranching families, we're seeing large corporations in there. They control the majority of public land interest when it comes to livestock grazing. There's still the myth in the West that cowboy is king, and unfortunately, that myth is being sustained at the health of our public land. We have uh, one property of BLM land that we have a number of wild horses, and uh, they are uh, uh, quite a problem to the range. They have a tendency to go to the same area and they overgraze tremendously and they absolutely destroy the range. And yet we are out there you know, trying to implement the most sophisticated and modern uh, range management policies relative to uh, livestock grazing. The horse can't even get in the same ballpark with domestic livestock when it comes to destroying range. Now that's not an indictment of all ranchers. Many ranchers manage their range very well. Many don't. If it's competition for grass and it's public lands, well, I'm not sure that the horse is always the culprit there, particularly when the cattle and the sheep outnumber the horses so greatly. But we're moving now from a topic of horses into the New West versus the Old West. As far as I know, everything that's been studied has tried to look at what the detrimental impact of horses are, but not what their functioning role is in an ecosystem. How do they fit into the ecosystem? Do they play a role? And are they integral components of that ecosystem in which they live? Through eons of time in uh, this area, wild horses were part of the, the ecology of the landscape. Horses are a herding animal. Their characteristic is to move into an area, do their thing, whether it's water or, or, or feed, and then move. A little bit inherent, like the bison, you know, it used to rumble into an area and water up, and, and when they leave, it was obvious that they were there and they left their impact, but they uh, would not return to that location for some time. And so that gives your, your resources a chance to recover. Grazing animals, uh, that's how a lot of these rangelands developed over time is through it because of animal impact to our soil surface. As far as damage in the range, any kind of species of animal can damage their resources for a short period of time, but we tend to think in short terms of two or three years. If you look at, at a 30 to 40 year period, I would bet that, that uh, it's a least sustaining level of uh, a resource because back to the herding they'll they'll do something to a piece of ground and move on. Sportsmen raise this issue all the time. They say that uh, if you allow wild horses in deer range pretty soon we're not going to have any deer so we'll get rid of the horses. But you know it's one of these gut feelings that they get because it looks as though they should be competing and but the studies that I'm aware of indicates that that in fact isn't the case. The Colorado State studies and the priors have shown that there's no overlap or not any significant overlap in even diet. The competition between bighorn sheep and horses is not a reality and the competition between mule deer and horses is not a reality. It's really more of a perception than a fact that they have any, any bearing on, uh, on wildlife populations. If horses were allowed to range freely across the land as they really should be, they would be able to spread out that impact and they would certainly move from area to area. The problem is that they are fenced in. They are constrained to particular areas. They have literally constructed hundreds of thousands of miles of fences on our public lands at taxpayer expense to create, for all intents and purposes, nothing more than livestock pastures to control livestock. 
But not only are they controlling and confining livestock, they're also confining wild horses, and that's impeding the free movement of these animals. What we have done, for the most part, we have forced wild horses into some of the most inhospitable places that you can find, simply because there was desired land use for these other areas. So we have artificially shoved large concentrations of horses into places where they obviously were never in large concentrations. Seems like the, the horse is losing out to all kind of special interests. I think uh, the developers uh, are moving in those areas and moving up to the hilltops and as the feed gets less and less, they do come down into the communities and therefore everybody starts griping and they start gathering these horses and then creating a bigger problem with supposedly excess horses. In 1971 when they passed the act, there were many, many areas with wild horses. The BLM has arbitrarily decided whether those ranges should be removed or not, and they have removed many of them. Yeah, there's three up there. What's happening is they're zeroing out the herd management areas, and they have not, as far as I know, counted, been counted for a very long time. So I don't think we're going to know when we're getting dangerously close to not having any more wild horses. There's a feeling for stomping out a piece of history. The risk isn't that you get down to the last animal, the risk is you get down to a critical threshold whereby the population becomes inbred and then if you get a very severe environmental event, the whole bunch could go. They're certainly not an endangered species but uh, they do have some characteristics that they've developed that are, uh, you know, make them a great horse for especially something like uh, endurance riding. This facility is uh, set up to prepare horses for adoption and uh, they are animals that are brought in here, uh, they're aged, checked over by the veterinarian, and we freeze mark them and inoculate them for all the major equine diseases. The younger horses um, are then shipped out uh, for adoption events all across the country. Now, minimum bid on any horse is $125. The main method we have of placing excess wild horses and burros is in our Adopt-A-Horse program. And we have uh, well over 170,000 adopters in the United States since this program began. They're rounding up wild horses uh, and putting them in holding facilities sometimes for months and even years at a time because the pipeline that the BOM has is full of horses at times and they can't adopt all the horses out that they've gathered. So, you know, it's not only bad for the taxpayers to be paying all this money for feeding and taking care of horses in holding facilities, waiting for them to eventually be adopted, but it's bad for the animals themselves. They're withering away. It's driven by supply. It's not we have 50 qualified adopters who want to adopt a horse who can give a horse a good a good home. It's that we have in Wyoming they're saying 2,000 surplus horses. So they remove them from their natural habitat and then try to generate enough people to absorb those horses. So it's kind of a backwards adoption program. The marketing now is to adopt, adopt, adopt. And that's creating the funnel uh, for them to take more horses off of the, of the lands. Congratulations. You've just joined thousands of Americans who've adopted wild horses through BLM's Adopt-A-Horse program. BLM and the Forest Service manage these federal lands for a balance among all the animals that use them, livestock, wildlife, and wild horses.
To sustain a thriving natural ecological balance and maintain healthy herds, these agencies gather wild horses from the range and give United States residents like yourself the opportunity to adopt a horse. For saddle and pleasure riding, reining competition, endurance riding, or using your horse as a pack animal. And since the inception of the Adopt-A-Horse program in 1973, over 100,000 wild horses have been successfully adopted by Americans by BLM. Some people fall in love with these noble creatures. Others like their sure-footed adaptive nature. When you feed and care for your animal properly, you'll see the signs of a healthy horse. A sleek, glossy coat, alert eyes, and a smooth body line with no bony protrusions. Adopting a wild horse can be highly satisfying and an adventure in itself. Remember, the more humanely you treat your horse, the more rewarding the experience will be. Enjoy your living legend. People are, are fascinated when they find out about this program. It's one of the greatest things that many of our western states have going for them. There's nothing like uh, the spirit of the American West, and they see it in the wild horse. We adopted seven of them only to get them out of the range, and we don't, we don't even plan on using them. They're, they're so worthless. They're, they're coarse, they're heavy-footed, and they're, they're just something that you would not want, really, to break. So they're basically worthless. You don't want to put the investment into breaking a 17-year-old stud that uh, uh, that is required to make a decent horse out of him. So what you do is just end up adopting him to get him off the range, and that's what we did. Until something changes, I think adoption is going to remain our primary method of, of uh, taking good care of the excess animals. Adopt a horse has been a fascinating lesson in biology. As you reduce the densities of ungulates, reproduction becomes more efficient. Animals breed at a younger age. Uh, they breed more often. The survival of the young is greater than it was before. So as we gather these horses and then gather all the young, it's like throwing an on switch for those mares that we turn back onto the range. They are now going to come into estrus and they're going to breed, and they're going to breed successfully. And adopt a horse if it has done nothing else except, except cost the taxpayer an immense amount of money, has proven the textbooks right. There is compensatory reproduction. And as you reduce the density, reproduction speeds up. They don't have any desire to live with humans. They don't have any desire to see humans or be fed by humans or cared by humans. They have an interest in maintaining their freedom and maintaining their wild, free-roaming nature. So I certainly do not think it would be okay to take, I, I don't agree that it's okay to take a wild animal and take away their freedom. Even if we provide the best home on earth for them, that's better than mistreating them, but still it takes away that the most important thing to that animal, which is their freedom. We do get a lot of people that come in and look and think, you know, it's kind of like getting a puppy from the pound and it's not. These horses are totally wild. Uh, we do not work with them here. We don't have a program where we can gentle them down at our facility. So most of the horses probably going through the adoption program have never been handled. We ask these animals to become domesticated and in many cases some never do. It's very difficult to try to keep these animals and to train them and domesticate them. It is not as simple as it appears. Many of these animals end up in sale barns and the only people who purchase these animals at sale barns are slaughter buyers. BLM has, still has ownership of these animals for one year, and then title passes to the person who adopted these animals. And there has been evidence where these horses have been sold to slaughterhouses a day or two after title has passed. One could theoretically adopt a horse from BLM for $125 keep the horse for at least a year before title passes, and then sell that horse for six or seven hundred dollars. And there is a market for um, not only wild horses, but horses being slaughtered for meat, and the, the market is overseas in foreign countries. There's a tremendous horse meat market.
unfortunately the government does not believe that they have any responsibility or um, authority over these animals after that adoption period because they believe it's perfectly legal for these animals to be sold and they do go for commercial uses. Perhaps maybe our failure with so many of these animals going to slaughter is that we are attempting to domesticate a wild animal. And the adoption pipeline is a direct consequence of the authority agency refusing to manage and protect these horses on the range where they belong. Being in conservation biology, I don't see any biological issues anymore in conservation. They're political or economic or social or cultural. And these poor animals like wolves and bison and horses are just symbols for the different sides to rally around. If you have a natural aversion to something, it's pretty easy to drum up a case, uh, whether it's horses or anything else, that makes what you have an aversion to look bad and everything else look good. And here we have a case where a, a whole group of animals that, that was very successful in the millions in North America at one time has been castigated and blemished um, for reasons that are basically unfounded. Very hard to bring something back when it's gone. And I think that that would diminish the richness of life that you and me and everybody else has. And I think it applies to everything, not just horses, but everything else that, that we would have the chance to keep and, and for one reason or another, we obliterate. And they should be venerated by the management agencies, the BLM or whoever, as something more important than an unfortunate accident. If we wrote them off, would we understand that they came from a lineage that not only was native in the New World, but had evolved in the New World for millions of years. North America is their home, their heartland. I firmly do think that wild horses belong in North America. Horses are a wildlife species that ought to be out there on the landscape.